Today, I wanted to provide an overview of, of the Glue server and the OpenID Connect uh, features and how we integrate um, specifically with um, Shibboleth and, and SAML sites. And so um, let's start with, um, with this diagram, just sort of high level overview. Um, so the Glue server is a, um, it's a distribution of, um, of free open source um, components. And you could, th it's, it's, we distribute the Glue server as a Chiroot container. Um, some, some of you might be familiar with this, not to be confused with Docker containers, but we, um, we use this file system container and we include um, these um, various open source components, um, some of which we wrote and some of which we adopted from um, existing projects that we liked. So when you install the Glue server, um, we, we have packages for Linux. So we are currently supporting CentOS 6.7, Ubuntu 14 and 16, Red Hat 6.7, and uh, Debian 8. So the Glue server, it's super easy to install. Um, I can show you, I, I, just, I just installed the server. Um, basically, what you're going to do is um, just, um, um, maybe I should show the, um, show it on the docs. Basically, you're going to install the package, um, and um, so if we look at, let's look at Ubuntu, for example. Um, so you're going to, you know, add, our, add the Glue repository to your list of repositories. You need to add our key, repository key. Um, you're going to update, and then you're going to install the server. So it's really, really easy to install. Um, after you have the package installed, um, you'll you'll start the um, the server. Um, so um, basically, you'll you'll just do service glue server start, um, and then you'll run the setup program. Um, so when you run um, the setup program, it asks you a bunch of questions: um, your um, IP address, host name. It asks you all these questions about um, that are used to generate a certificate like the city and state. Um, it'll ask you how much memory you want to give the server. Um, it'll um, then ask you for the components. So the first four components are required. That's the OAuth 2 server, OxAuth, the admin UI, the LDAP server, and Apache HTTPD. And then it'll ask you for these optional components. So the Shibboleth SAML IDP, that's version 3, um, the Asimba SAML proxy, OxAuth RP. This is a sample test um, web application. Um, Passport is used for social login. And now, as of Glue Server 3, we switch to, uh, to Oracle JDK um, um, 8. So you, you also have to um, accept the, um, the Oracle um, Java license. So after you um, select your components, it will um, basically, you know, confirm this is what you want to install, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, at that point, your your server should be up and running, and you're ready to log in. So, in a lot of ways, um, using using the Glue server is probably the easiest way to install Shibboleth. Um, no deploying the WAR file or setting up Tomcat or or Jetty or um, really, you just um, Run the um, run the setup program, answer the questions, and um, and your server um, should be installed. Um, when you um, um, if we exit the container, um, what you'll find is is that the Glue server only installs in two locations in your Unix system. So there'll be um, a startup script in etc init.d. So you'll see the Glue server startup script. And, and this will always be prefixed, or uh, not prefixed, I guess, suffixed with the, um, with the version. And then um, in addition to the init.d directory, you'll see in the op directory, we have op glue server. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned before, this is a full um, container. So if we cd into this directory, we'll see a full Linux distribution, everything from slash down. Um, and this is how we're able to um, to 
make it so easy to configure is because we're giving you the components all installed in place. And when you run that setup program, you're just generating the last mile of configuration. So you're generating the certificates for SAML and for the HTTPD server. Um, you're generating the keys and um, sort of the initial starting configuration. Um, so um, when you, to log into the container, um, you do service glue server login. So now if I do CD slash, I'm actually in opt glue server. Um, but, um, you know, when I do this, um, like I said, it's a file system container. So it, it's, um, you know, similar to, you know, BSD jail or Solar, um, um, where it's just changing the root. Um, so if I do a PS minus EF, um, I'll see all the processes on the system. This is what's different. Docker would have process isolation. If I do if config minus A, I'll see the, the um, this is the host Ethernet address. So also Docker would have its own uh, private addresses. So anyway, we like this strategy. And it's a pretty easy way to install, um, you know, both Shibboleth um, and um, um, our, our OpenID Connect stack. So the strategy for, um, for integrating the, the two platforms is that we have a, a login handler in Shibboleth that looks for an OpenID Connect session. Um, so we chose this strategy because we wanted to make sure that we defined the business logic for authentication in one place. So for example, if you were needed to use Duo authentication, we didn't want to have one procedure for installing the Duo plugin in SAML and one procedure for enabling Duo and OpenID Connect. Um, we felt it was really important to have to only define the business logic for authentication in one place. Um, also, OxAuth, the OpenID Connect provider, um, is extremely flexible with regard to enabling you to define multi-step authentication workflows. Um, so um, even, you know, like five years ago, we were handling with no problem the multi-step authentications like Duo. Uh, when, when we saw everyone on the list struggling with, you know, with these multi-step multi, multi -step workflows in Shibboleth, we couldn't really understand it. Um, so um, I'll, I'll do a slightly deeper dive on this in a second, but, but this is a, um, probably one of the biggest advantages um, it, is that um, um, the flexibility you get. So a um, couple other things to note. Um, we wanted to keep the configuration for Shibboleth um, and the OpenID provider simple. So we don't like using dynamic scopes. Um, so our basic strategy in the Glue server is to um, use this LDAP server, this local LDAP server, um, synchronize it with a existing LDAP server, like maybe Active Directory or Open LDAP. Um, and that way we have a copy of all the users in this LDAP server. And along the way, we can transform attributes. So if there's some attribute that isn't present in the, um, in the let's say, Active Directory server, um, we have these scripts that enable us to um, implement, you know, some code to render an attribute. Um, take edu person scope affiliation. A lot of um, um, universities don't have this in their backend AD, so, but maybe they have some information that allows us to figure out what the right, um, you know, what the right role for this person is. So um, basically, during, synch during synchronization, we can create an attribute called EduPerson Scoped Affiliation and give it the right value. And at that time, that attribute is available from both OpenID Connect and for, for SAML. Um, what else can I say? Um, the um, sessions are, um, um, so the session, you, you'll actually have two sessions, an OpenID Connect session and a SAML session. Um, however, you will have single sign-on between OpenID Connect and SAML applications. So for example, um, if you go to 
a SAML site, um, what happens is is um, the you get redirected to the OpenID provider. You authenticate. You get an OpenID Connect session. You get sent back to SAML. It creates its SAML session, and you get sent back to the application. Um, if you then, after that, go to an OpenID Connect site, well, you already have a session, OpenID Connect session, in the browser, so you don't have to log in. And likewise, if you go the other direction, if you go to an OpenID Connect site first, you'll get a session, and then when you hit a SAML site, um, the Shibboleth IDP won't have a, a session, but it'll it'll see that you have an OpenID Connect session, it'll get the information it needs, and then send you back to the um, SAML app. Um, so this approach um, has been working for us for a long time, and um, um, and seems to um, um, you know we think it, it keeps it simple because we have a very standard like deployment of the Shibboleth um, IDP. Um, so um, um, one other um, um, strategy that we use is we felt that. It was difficult for administrators um, to hand edit XML files. So um, this admin UI um, actually renders some of the configuration files for Shibboleth. Um, so we templated the, um, the Shibboleth, um, the commonly like modified um, Shibboleth um, XML files. And when you create SSO with a new website, um, Oxtrust um, automatically renders those files and then they're picked up um, depending upon your um, refresh period in Shibboleth. But, um, so it's sort of a loose integration, um, but we felt that it um, um, made it easier, a little bit easier to manage the, uh, the Shibboleth IDP. Um, so um, before I do the demo, um, any questions on, um, uh, let me unmute everyone. Um, um, any, uh, any questions on um, this uh, be brief overview? Uh, just a quick one about um, versions for the SAML IDP and uh, <clears throat> what uh, code base are you using for the OpenID Connect client? Um, for the OpenID Connect client. Um, do you mean um, a website that um, that's using OpenID Connect and wants to connect to the Glue server? No, I'm just asking uh, as you developed. Sorry, uh, as you develop your OpenID, say authenticator, uh, oh, okay. is there a code code base that you're relying on? And similarly for the SAML IDP, it's just which version of that. You, you know, I'm, um, I haven't looked at that code myself, but. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's the it's our own libraries. So Glue has a really comprehensive set of Java libraries for OpenID Connect um, because, um, well, A, we have a couple of clients out there, and B, you can't write an OpenID Connect server unless you have the corresponding client software to test it. Um, so we have a really comprehensive OpenID Connect library, and we, we very, I, I can't imagine we use anything but that in our, in our login handler. Um, but like I said, I haven't seen the code. Um, so, any other questions? Um, that code, the login handler, by the way. So all Glue code is on is on GitHub. Um, so there is probably I forget the name of it because we've had a couple of these. But um, let's see, this one is from February 16th. So this is this is this is the code. Um, for the um, for the for the login handler, um, so um, yeah, every, everything is, um, is 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 up on um, is up on GitHub. Um, so our our philosophy is is that the Glue server uh, we're committed to free open source. There's no difference between the commercial. There is no commercial version of Glue. There's only one version, and the packages are free. The the code is, um, you know, published on GitHub, and support is free. Also, um, anybody can post on support.glue.org. Although um, we do, if you get a support contract with us, we give you a, a guaranteed response time and um, private support. Um, but public support um, is is free um, um, on our on our support site. 
Um, okay, well, well um, so I'm going to focus um, on, um, oh wait, there's one question in chat. And let me expand, I need to expand my chat window. Um, so this question is, um, Um, so, Andres, um, um, that question I would say post on the support forum. It sounds like there's something wrong with your installation. Um, and post the version and the logs and everything like that. Um, so, um, okay, let, let, let's go on. Um, so, um, I, have, um, I have actually um, two... Um, servers, local servers running on my ser on my machine. Um, one of them is, um, um, one of them is the glue server and um, one of them is um, a sample web application, which I just installed, which I, I think I'm going to show it, but it's a little risky. We'll show it. We'll see how it, do it does. Um, so um, um, let's talk a little bit about um, um, SAML and OpenID Connect and sort of do a compare contrast. Um, so, um, um, you know, in SAML, um, the, if we look at um, the SAML metadata, um, so on this server, um, let's see, um, what is the URL? So I installed the server, um, so this is, you know, if you go to slash IDP slash shibboleth in SAML, um, it returns the metadata. And the metadata, of course, you know, gives you the URLs where the SAML services are provided um, and, the, um, and the, the public keys, for the public certificate for the, um, for the server. And, of course, it's an XML file. Um, so in um, OpenID Connect, um, we have a very similar um, type of, of functionality. So in OpenID Connect, um, if you go to dot well-known slash OpenID configuration, you get back the discovery document. Um, so this is according to the OpenID Connect discovery um, endpoint or um, uh, specification. So, um, so this tells you um, the URLs where the services are provided, just like SAML. Um, it also tells you um, what um, what kind of crypto is supported and other configuration information that your client might need in order to configure itself. Um, we also have the JWKS URI. Um, so this is um, um, basically the uh, the public keys for the server. Um, so similar to SAML, the, these are it's okay to publish them. They're not secret. They're the public keys. Um, in OpenID Connect, um, keep in mind that key registration happens every two days. Um, one of the um, um, ideas, and that's not for security, it's really the idea behind that was to make sure that if clients don't handle key rotation that you find out um, very quickly. Um, so it's better that they break in two days while the developer is still working on the app then it breaks in like a year later after everyone's forgot, um, you know, what to do. Um, so that's um, that's sort of discovery. Um, and um, um, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, um, cl uh, client applications. So in OpenID Connect, the idea, or I'm sorry, in SAML, let's say um, you um, pretty much. Are, have web, um, they're all mostly server-side web applications. So if you're running SHIB, um, SHIB D, um, then um, you're using the, the Apache, an Apache filter or filter and, a, and a, sort of a connector between SHIB D and the Apache server. Um, but there's more, there's, um, you know, since recently there's a couple other, um, you know, patterns that people want to use. So, um, in, um, in OpenID Connect, I guess the equivalent of ShibD is um, Glue has a, a product called OxD, um, which is um, like ShibD, it's a service that, um, that runs locally. Um, and um, we have, um, 
um, various libraries that you can use to connect to the service. Um, so there's libraries for um, um, Python, Java, PHP, Node, Ruby, C Sharp, Perl, and Go. Um, um, I was going to show actually this 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 diagram. So um, so um, option two is sort of like um, shibboleth. Um, so you have um, you're using the web server um, as as the policy enforcement point to make sure there's a session. And then if there's a session, you're you're passing the um, um, user information to the backend app, usually through the headers, the HTTP headers. Um, so this is a really common approach. It's used in lots of uh, enterprise SSO platforms. Um, so option one is um, a lot of applications don't like this idea that there's some external um, um, architectural like component that you need to run different software on. So um, a lot of app developers today just want to call the APIs. So this is a, this is another common uh, pattern. And so uh, for OpenID Connect, we have uh, if you want to use this pattern, there's um, um, software mod auth OpenIDC is is um, really the best software out there if you want an Apache filter. And just like you know, so you have a folder and you can say to traverse this folder, um, you need to um, have a session, and it passes information. Either you can pass the ID token itself, um, which is like a SAML assertion, or you could um, pass the um, um, user information in the headers. Um, there's also an Nginx plugin um, if you if you prefer Nginx. Um, and um, so if you want to use this approach, actually this is where we we would say use OxD. So if you want to um, integrate the um, OpenID Connect directly in your application, then you um, your developers will need some type of um, some type of native library. So if you're a Java programmer, you'll be looking for the Java libraries. Um, so here's where um, we introduce OxD as this local service, and then all of those libraries that I showed before basically connect to this local service and provide the uh, native interface um, to the um, um, to the um, to the mediator OxD. So um, all right, so those are that's that's for web applications. But what about um, we have two other types of applications. Um, there's um, applications that are running entirely in the browser. So um, browser client applications, and there's mobile applications. So for, um, for browser applications, um, Glue publishes this library called the OpenID Implicit Client. Um, and this is really, um, it's probably the simplest library to use. Um, you can um, um, really just configure it in the HTML itself. So in the HTML, basically, you, you just um, you know call those JavaScript methods. Um, so um, um, there's a there's another um, pretty good um, um, JavaScript library out there also, um, besides the one that that we're we're supporting. Um, and then for for mobile applications. Um, there's new libraries from OpenID Foundation um, that were written by Google um, called App Auth, and there's so there's App Auth libraries for um, um, Android and for um, for um, iOS. Um, and the idea with App Auth is that um, so there was a lot of um, um, ways that developers could go wrong. Um, authenticating people using mobile in a mobile app. Um, also, there it, there was a question about how do we get single sign-on between mobile applications. So if you write two mobile apps, or maybe you have a mobile app and a browser application, um, how can you get single sign-on across those um, those apps? Um, so Google introduced App Auth. Um, they um, um, are using some some advanced features of OAuth. Um, that um, help mitigate some of the attacks. Um, one of the um, the strategies is called Pixie PKCE. Um, this is where the client does not have a um, client secret, um, but it it registers um, a um, an extra code 
um, during the um, authorization process um, in lieu of using a client secret. Um, there's basically no way to protect a client secret in the mobile app. Mobile apps can be decompiled. Um, and um, the other um, strategy it uses is called custom URI schemes. Um, so it registers basically the callback through the browser. So it tells the browser, you know, when you see this callback um, scheme, you know, invoke this application. And um, so it's 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 using OpenID Connect, but it's also using some o, um, some um, other OAuth two uh, features. And um, so AppAuth um, before AppAuth, um, developers were using web views. Um, web views were really problematic. Um, it allowed the um, the potentially the user's credentials to be um, snooped by the application. Uh, or, or also the client credentials. So, um, so web views. Um, Google um, is going to actually um, um, stop supporting web view based authentication. Um, so they've given everyone notice, and they and Google won't let any of their employees use any apps that use web views for authentication. So web views are really um, considered a bad practice. If you have any apps using web views, you know, upgrade them. Um, and um, anyway, so the Glue server and Glue and Ping are really the, the were the two first um, platforms to support um, to support AppAuth. Um, Google and Okta are the two SaaS providers that, that support it. Um, this was as of CIS um, last year, um, but it sort of raises an interesting point about uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth, which is that there's a lot of innovation in OAuth. Um, there's 16 RFCs, there's 16 draft RFCs, so keeping up with OAuth is really a, a quite a task because um, it's it's still it's still um, you know so rapidly um, being developed and 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 risks are being um, mitigated with with new with new drafts. So um, so anyway, just to review, it sort of gives you an idea of the types of um, apps that you might have, um, basically web applications, um, you know, things like Ruby on Rails or, or Spring. Um, you have browser applications, you have a um, web server filter, and you have um, um, browser-based um, client applications. Um, and um, let me open it up to questions on um, on apps. Anyone have questions on apps or how to integrate apps with OpenID Connect? Okay. Um, so let's um, um, let me let me do a quick demo of the glue, of the Glue server, and it'll it'll give you an idea of, of how. Um, how we can define business logic for authentication and, and how that's used um, by both um, SAML and OpenID Connect. Um, so as I mentioned, we wanted to define um, strong authentication in one place. So um, let me go to my server. Um, so this is um, 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 Oxtrust. Um, this is the admin interface um, for, for the Glue server. Um, so I'll log in um, as Mike, and then um, it's going to ask me to, um, to press the button on my U2F token. Let me do that. Um, so I'll share my video for a second. Um, so a quick divergence on U2F, um, Glue. Um, there's a lot of U2F tokens out there. You know, a lot of you probably know the YubiKey. Um, there's a Chinese um, version made by Fetion. Um, different form factors of, of um, YubiKey, um, this little one. Um, there's quite a few vendors now besides YubiKey. We have this one, which is like a credit card. Um, we have the one that I was using is actually this one. It's an open hardware one. Um, there's um, this one just came out. It's only five dollars. Um, we have um, another Chinese one. Um, this one is six dollars. Um, we have um, even some wireless ones now. Um, this is a new Fetion um, U2F device that's Bluetooth. Um, and uh, Vasco came out with um, this nice one, uh, which is uh, called SecureClick. 
um, also a Bluetooth um, 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 device. Um, so, um, quick, quick divergence on, on, so let me show you how, how we implemented that. Um, so in the Glue server, um, if you want to define um, authentication, um, we have these things called custom authentication scripts. Um, so what we found is is that um, a lot of a lot of organizations have custom requirements for authentication. Um, you know, you could be supporting um, social login um, and need to do dynamic enrollment. Um, you could um, um, want to call APIs for fraud detection. Um, you might want to call two-factor authentication services like um, like um, um, like Duo Security. Um, um, Mick is asking for the link to the um, Plisic client. Let me just give him that. Um, so um, basically, um, um, the idea is is that there's so much variance in the requirements for authentication that the only way you can really satisfy them is to let the um, customer just provide their own code. Um, so um, um, each each of the Glue server supports uh, multiple um, um, scripts. Um, so each script has a name, um, but you can see, so I've enabled the U2F script, but we also ship um, with some other uh, built-in two factors. Um, Super Glue is, um, it's a free mobile app that we wrote. Um, it looks sort of like um, Duo Security. Um, I can show the docs. Um, so um, if you've seen Duo Security, it um, sends a push notification. Um, after you log in, um, it sends a, um, a push notification to your phone and says, you, you know, here's this person is trying to log in from this location. Do you want to approve it? Um, so this is free on the App Store. There's also an open source version of this. If you want to brand it your, with your own app and publish your own app on the App Store, um, you can uh, fork our, um, our Android and iOS um, open source version. Um, so we also have Duo. Duo is quite popular. Uh, most of you probably know Duo. We have certificate login for smart cards and browser certs. Um, we have CAS. Um, if your CAS server is authoritative, which I'm not sure is such a good idea, but if that's true, you can use it. Um, we have Google, which is an example of social login. Um, a Simba is for inbound SAML. If you have um, want to consolidate, you have a number of um, providers who have their own SAML IDPs. Um, we have OTP authentication built in as of version three. Um, so we support both TOTP and HOTP. So um, I know OTP is sort of old, um, but it's actually like not a bad option. Um, I like, um, this is a, a, an OTP uh, card uh, made by Fetion. Um, could be a good backup credential. Um, Fetion also has these devices, um, this little guy, um, you know, same type of thing. And of course you have a Google Authenticator. Um, so what else do we have in here? Um, Twilio, um, if you want to do SMS-based authentication. Um, Passport is a new feature we have for social login. So if you have, um, if you look at Passport JS, um, you'll see that it has over 307 different social sites that you can use. Um, and we have UbiCloud for their OTP and UAF is new. So you get the idea. There's a lot of types of authentication. Um, in the OpenID Connect spec, um, there's a value called ACR values. And this allows you to, for, allows a client to request a certain type of authentication. So if we look in the, openid.net slash connect. Um, in the core spec, um, under authentication request, um, you'll see that the last parameter is called ACR values. Um, so it, this corresponds basically to the name of the script. So if you request, if your client requests ACR values equals U2F, then you'll get U2F authentication. Um, SAML has a similar feature in the SAML um, authentication request. You can also request an ACR. Um, the Glue server doesn't currently 
it will use that that um, that variable. Um, we're in in the next version, 3.1. We have it on the roadmap to map ACR and the SAML request um, to um, basically ACR and OpenID Connect. Um, right now, in the Glue server, um, when you, SAML always gets the default authentication method, um, so. Um, you can basically say, if the client doesn't request a specific type of authentication, this is the method that they're going to get routed to. So right now, currently, SAML always gets the default authentication mechanism. But like I said, we're looking to um, um, add support for the um, ACR uh, parameter in SAML also. Um, next version. Um, what else can I say? Um, you can re-authenticate. Um, if you want to, um, um, maybe a person authenticated with password and you want to have them use two-factor authentication, um, OpenID Connect has a parameter called prompt. So you, if you say prompt equals login, um, you could the, you're basically telling the authorization server that you should re-prompt the user for authentication. So you can use prompt equals login and ACR values in combination to um, to get the user to um, authenticate better. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, ACR, this level is a, not an open ID connect feature. It's actually a glue feature. But we put that in the ID token to just uh, allow you to set a numeric um, sort of like um, representation of the values in case you wanted to say like U2F is 10, Duo is 15, you know, certificates are 20, you could sort of set some um, um, policies based upon the level. Um, and um, so, um, and, and I could probably go on about authentication, but any, any questions about authentication um, in particular? Um, okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about um, parallels in, in, in OpenID Connect um, and SAML. So um, let's start with SAML. So um, if I add a relationship in SAML, um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, import the metadata for that website. So um, in the Glue server supports, you can upload a file. Um, you can specify a URI. Um, if you have imported um, federation metadata like in common, you could specify that as the source of the um, of the SP metadata. And generate is sort of like I'll do it later. But at some point, you're going to have to um, provide the um, um, the um, you know the metadata for the SP. Um, you're going to configure the relying party. Basically, everybody's using SAML2 SSO pretty much, so you're going to almost always add that. And then you're going to say, what attributes do you want to release um, to this um, um, to this particular service provider? So you know, this is you, you guys sort of know the drill um, with SAML. Um, in the Glue server, we use Transient ID as the default name ID, so it's almost always a good idea to release Transient ID. Um, we'll give it a name, my website, and um, basically you're going to hit um, submit, and it's going to generate the XML. Um, but but what I sort of wanted to show was like the basic idea is is you're going to um, you know import the metadata for the um, um, for the SP and release attributes. That's a general idea. So um, OpenID Connect um, in a lot of ways is JSON REST SAML. So all the jargon has changed, but the basic ideas are, are the same. Um, so um, instead of releasing attributes, um, OpenID Connect uses, the, uses OAuth2 scopes. Um, so scopes um, really, the, tech, the technical definition is the extent of the authorization. Um, but OpenID Connect basically says you're authorizing this client to release these user claims about the person. Um, it's sort of an interesting, um, um, helpful idea for um, attribute release because we can group attributes together and provide one human understandable description. So if we need to um, get a um, consent from the user, um, we can do that in bulk. 
Um, if you need to have a one scope per attribute, that's okay too. Like something like date of birth, um, a lot of times that, or email even, might have its own scope and there might just be one attribute. But, you know, for something like a, you know, physical mailing address, it could be convenient to kind of group a bunch of attributes together and just provide one description. Um, so, um, um, so um, the equivalent of the SP in, um, in OpenID Connect would be a client. Um, so um, a client, um, in, in SAML, we generally think that a client has um, a cert public certificate um, that identifies it. Um, in OpenID Connect, uh, it's a little bit more flexible. So um, instead of a certificate, the client um, OpenID Connect and, um, supports a couple of different uh, mechanisms. Um, um, so the commonly you'll see developers using API key and secret. Um, OpenID Connect also supports um, private key authentication. And then we have this weird one of none. Um, so if you have a JavaScript client or a um, a mobile client, then um, there's no point, there's no way to protect a secret or a private key. And so in this case, um, um, no, the, you, you, there, you have to use no authentication. Um, the trust model um, for JavaScript clients is based solely on the redirect URI. So the, the, just like in, in SAML, the response is always going to only go to the pre-registered URL um, for this client. Um, so, um, so, you know, JavaScript clients are less secure than server-side clients because they can't use client authentication um, to obtain a token. All we have is the redirect URI. Uh, mobile clients aren't quite as insecure because they use PKCE. There's sort of a workaround. Um, and um, so in, in SAML, we would release um, um, claims to the, to, the, um, to the service provider. In OpenID Connect, we're releasing um, groups of claims um, or, you know, scopes, which are groups of claims um, to the client. Um, in OpenID Connect, you always must release the OpenID scope. If you don't release the OpenID scope, it's not OpenID Connect. Um, so um, all other scopes are optional. Um, the OpenID scope just contains the, an identifier for the person. Um, that identifier can be either what's called a public or pairwise identifier. Um, so we have this subject type, public or pairwise. Um, so in Shibboleth, there's this concept of persistent non-correlatable identifiers. That's basically what a pairwise ID is. It's a different identifier for the person for each website. Uh, a public, um, public identifiers are mapped to a certain LDAP attribute. So in the Glue server, we have this primary key for entries called INUM, and we, the default uh, public subject type is INUM, but you could map this to email address or, um, or username, um, whatever your preference is. Um, but just keep in mind, if you use the public identifier, if, you're, if you use my email address and I go to two different websites, of course, um, I can be correlated across, across those websites. Um, the default setting for clients is pairwise. Um, this messes clients up a little bit, um, but we default to the more privacy-protecting subject type. Um, so just keep that in mind is that um, if you're setting up a new client, um, that you might want to switch subject type if you, if you're, if you don't want to get um, a different subject identifier for each, uh, at each website. Um, there's some more stuff about, um, so sector identifier URI, this is sort of maybe a little too deep for this conversation, but if you have a group of related websites that need the same sub, um, pairwise identifier, um, you can register a, web, um, a website that has a, li a link of all the redirector URIs that should give it back the same pairwise ID. So there is a way to group, um, um, basically a, a group of related websites um, that, that might be operated by one, one company. Um, the other thing that I see that really messes people up in, um, in OpenID Connect is the correct, getting the correct flow. So um, in OpenID Connect, 
um, we have several several different flows. So um, um, a good diagram, actually, let me show this one. Um, so you can think about it like this. Um, OpenID Connect um, oops, um, has, um, you know, you can sort of move up security levels. So the, at the bottom of the diagram, we have the o OAuth by itself without OpenID Connect. So if you're using OAuth um, to, for um, authentication, then um, there's no, o OAuth doesn't define an ID token. Um, the ID token is not really a token at all. It's really an assertion. Uh, a SAML assertion is assigned in possibly encrypted XML. Um, an ID token is assigned and possibly encrypted JWT. Um, so, um, but you shouldn't really con um, confuse um, um, the ID token isn't presented to give you access to something. So it's really sort of misnamed. It's, it's really an identity assertion, not really a token at all. But um, without the ID token, um, you don't really have any, any signature from the, um, um, from the issuing um, open, OpenID provider or IDP. So the implicit flow, which doesn't have any client authentication, you can still get back an ID token um, which means it's a signed assertion from the IDP saying who this person is. So OpenID Connect implicit flow is still better than plain OAuth. Um, code flow is a little more secure because the, um, the, the client presents client credentials, um, which could be a secret or um, a key in order to obtain a token. So it's, it's always going to be a little more secure than a, a browser-based application. Then these two flows, which OpenID Connect defines called hybrid flow, are probably the most misunderstood. Um, so um, the idea with the hybrid flow is that um, when you um, you can add additional signing into the authorization code flow um, in order to increase the integrity. So when you use um, um, basically the, the first level of hybrid flow um, when you get back the uh, ID token, it includes the code. So you can verify that the code that you received from the um, OpenID provider um, is the right one. Like maybe the code got switched by a man in the middle. So hybrid flow gives you a little bit of extra um, protection on the response from the OpenID provider. And then you can also encrypt your, um, your request. Um, so the hybrid flow is always code plus so, um, ID token. Um, and so the place where we see people go wrong is that when they define the response type for a client, they, they, they uh, request all three of these. They request code, ID token, and token. If you're doing the authorization code flow, you only need code. Um, so it's not actually going to hurt you but it, it's going to use extra disk space and memory. And so there's, there's no real, if you're using authorization code flow, there's no real advantage to getting back the ID token and token in, in the initial response. So anyway, uh, if you look in the OpenID Connect spec, actually they have a nice table here, um, which tells you response types and flows. So co if you want co uh, authorization code flow, you just use code for implicit flow. I recommend ID token token, and for hybrid flow, I recommend code ID token. Um, and these other ones are really not that useful. I don't see any use for code token or code ID token token. Um, so um, anyway, so that's um, there, there's um, one feature in the Glue server that we have is called pre-authorization. So um, in OpenID Connect, when you connect to a client, it'll prompt you, you know, are you sure, do you want to release attributes to this client? Um, that's a good thing, but if it's a portal application and you have 15 applications behind your portal, it could be annoying for the user. Um, so in the Glue server, we have this feature called pre-authorization where we let you um, sort of say, this is a client that I trust. Um, no need to prompt the user um, for that. Um, so we're, we have about five minutes left. Uh, I, I want to um, open it up to questions. Um, so um, that was a quick overview. I, I didn't have time to do my uh, my uh, demo app. Um, 
Um, I could maybe, if we don't have questions, then we can go over five minutes. I could maybe um, um, do just a quick demo. Um, but any questions? Um, did I did I sufficiently cover the topic of the the stated webinar? <laughs> Um, Mike, I have a question. I have a question. Do I have to use um, OxD um, to to, um, to set up to use Glue as my um, not service provider? What's the, the relay the relay Relying party? In, yeah, in an open in an open ID um, setup. Yeah, that's a good okay. question. Yeah. So can um, I use like C sharp or something like that? Yeah, so actually, um, if you look at OpenID Connect, there's a lot of libraries out there. Um, and um, so any so the Glue server um, is, is certified. Um, and um, let's see, um, they used to have uncertified. Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's quite a number of libraries out there. Um, so as long as these are standard OpenID Connect libraries, they'll work with the Glue server. Um, so no, you don't need to use OxD. Um, the reason we introduced OxD is because we found that the quality of these libraries varies greatly. Some of them are, are like this, this one's a perfect example, Apache L2. This shouldn't even be listed here as an OpenID Connect library because it doesn't validate the ID token. So if you write a good client, um, there's a number of um, essential things that you have to do. And in fact, it's really well documented. Um, they tell you exactly in the, in the implementer's guide um, exactly what you have to do. But what we found is that so many of the clients are not doing what, what they're supposed to do. And, um, and then our customers use them and then ask for support on them when things go wrong generally. And, and we're left telling them that, I'm sorry, this isn't a good client. And so this was sort of driving us crazy and we decided that in order for us to be, provide end-to-end -end support from the client to the server, it would make sense for us to release um, um, our own client library. Um, the other interesting thing about OxD is if there are, um, let's say, a lot, sometimes the vulnerabilities are in the client, not in the server. So if you, um, if you have um, a very um, heterogeneous environment with Node and you know, PHP and Python and Java applications, and some problem happens in the client, then you're left scrambling to go to all of these backend, um, you know, applications and wait for them to update and make sure that they address the, 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 the problem. So that was another motivator. And I guess the last thing is that our experience with supporting developers writing OpenID Connect applications is that um, OpenID Connect, it's, it's not that simple. It's actually sort of a pain in the neck. Um, and um, it's really easy to write a bad um, implementation that, that doesn't um, check the code or doesn't, um, um, anyway, there's, there's some ways to go wrong. And we felt that um, OxD provides an easier API. Um, the basic workflow is, um, you know, register your client. So we, OxD has five APIs. Register, um, get, um, um, get authorization URL, get token, get user info, and log out. So we kind of took a cue from Auth0. Um, Auth0 is really popular with developers. And we were trying to figure out, why don't people just use OpenID Connect? Uh, Open, uh, Auth0 themselves use OpenID Connect on the back end. And we figured out what Auth0 got right is that the, AP, the interface to developers for Connect is too hard. And by presenting a couple of easier APIs, um, we're able to really help developers like um, be more productive. Um, so, but um, anyway, to go back to your original question, um, no, you definitely don't have to use um, our, our libraries. Um, and, um, you know, there's quite a broad range of, of libraries that people are using today against the Glue server. Um, any other questions? Oh, one more thing. The, the, um, 
JavaScript library I was requesting. You said there was another one other than the one that Glue provides. I just wanted the link to that one or the name of that one. Yeah. Just to yeah. make a comparison. Let me find it. Yeah, it's quite good actually. Um, and it's uh, certified too. Um, yes, this one. Um, written by this guy Brock Allen. And um, yeah, and we're, we're, we're prepared to support this one. Um, we is there another one? Uh, I just put it in the chat. This is it. Um, in fact, we were a little confused with this library because it said it uses Node.js, and we were thinking of Node as server-side, so we weren't actually, we didn't know it was client-side. Had we known it was client-side, we might not have written the JavaScript library that we did, but being that we wrote it anyway, we sort of like are supporting it. But um, this one really looks good. It's free. And um, um, it, it's it's actually passed the RP certification, so um, I, that one looks pretty good too. Um, ours our library was actually based on um, a library that was written by um, um, Nat Sakamura, and um, who's the vice chairman of OpenID Foundation, and um, sort of a developer that that he engaged to write a sample app, but. Um, we like ours. Ours is sort of simple. It's like one file. Um, yeah. This is a little more, um, um, I don't know, it might even be better architected than ours. So, um, But um, anyway, they both, um, 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 we're, we're going to certify our, our implicit client also. And um, anyway, we did the work, so we're keeping it out there. But um, anyway, we like this one. Yeah. And one last question. Implicit flow is only for the you know client side JavaScript, correct? You can't use implicit flow with um, C sharp, like if you could like an HTTP. Correct. Um, okay. It's only for client side JavaScript. Yeah, we see that mistake all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, or the other one we see is people wanting to use implicit flow for mobile applications, and that's also totally wrong. Um, but it's very hard to figure out by reading the specifications that that's the case. Um, but yeah, the only the only use case for implicit flow is like Angular or other apps that are entirely browser-based. Browser. Okay. The other way is code flow. Okay. Yeah, and the code flow is going to be way more secure because if you have a .NET, um, let's say any type of server-side application, then you can protect the client secret on the server. You just can't protect it in the front channel in the browser. Okay. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, well, we could probably go on for, for quite a bit um, time longer. Um, and um, in the next six months or so, I'm hoping that my book will be done, um, but I'm working on a book called Deploying uh, Identity and Access Management with Free Open Source Software. And there's a chapter on um, OAuth2, um, also SAML, and OpenID Connect, and UMA. But um, anyway, I hope that um, we're, we're sort of above the hour now. So uh, I'll, I'll hold if anyone has any more questions. Or if not, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And if, um, if, if you need more information, um, my schedule is, is um, on the web, blue.org slash booking. Um, and um, feel free to schedule a meeting. I'd be happy to help. Um, and um, also, the guys from WashU are on. Uh, just want to say thanks for joining. And um, I went to WashU, so <laughs> nice to see my alma mater uh, make some hear about the Glue server. So, anything else? Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Mike.